Palantir CEO Alex Karp out here with a brand new interview. Going to react to this one here today. It's out three hours ago, so I'm looking forward to react to this video with you guys here today. I am personally a Palantir shareholder. It's a smaller position for me, but I'm a shareholder nonetheless. It's been a very interesting past year, I would say, for Palantir stock price. The stock price has basically been in a bottoming situation since May, May of 22, essentially, when the stock got down to the $6 range, essentially, and it's been up. It's been down, but it's basically kind of been that six to seven dollar range. Great company for the long term, has a beautiful future in front of it, has a lot of things that have kind of very negatively affected it in the short term, including stock based compensation, including like uh, companies basically moving a little slower than expected, and governments as well. So, there's been a, many various factors in there. So, hope you guys enjoyed today's video. As always, I appreciate everybody that subscribed to the channel 21,600 plus subscribers now on the channel. Thank you, everybody that subscribed to the channel. Also, if you enjoy the channel and you want to support us on Patreon, that will be the pinned comment down there. You also get access to all my stocks I am buying and selling in the Patreon portfolio in there as well. Let's jump into this. I'm very nice to happy. See you. How nice. many times have we been doing this? Uh, many, many, many times. times. Uh, yeah, I've... and we've been through a bit of a roller coaster. First off, holy smoke! Is it doing this thing outside? I don't think I could ever go to Davos, man. It's been like. Last night I went to the gym, uh, walked down the gym, it was like 37 degrees out, and I was like, oh my gosh, look at this. They're outdoors doing interviews in the snow, oh my gosh. The, the economy in terms of the world, geopolitics and everything. Where, what is your sense now, and what do you think the sensibility is here right now? Look, we've been meeting for many, many years, um, and when we first met here and you uh, filmed me, the idea that the world is disjointed, violent, unlikely to be pure and global, that world leaders would fight more than they get along, that there would be derision and division in major democracies, and that we'd see a war in Europe look like the nightmare fantasy of uh, uh, something that you would not believe could happen. And of course, we built our company on the idea that the world is disjointed, violent, but could be made better. I think the core issue for people behind closed doors at Davos is, okay, Clearly, the world is not going to be the way we thought it is. It clearly is not that, not going to be more peaceful, less disjointed. How can we still make the world actually function in a separated, disjointed world where there is war in the heart of Europe, where Western allies are having to mobilize against their adversaries, including Russia and China, where people still want to have industry, where supply chains are disrupted, and where we have pandemics? Your personal optimism or pessimism? Though right now, I mean, there's a lot of pessimism here. Yeah, I'm, look, we built our company and I believe in addressing the world as it is. We built our company around the way the world is now. I am pessimistic about the near future, very optimistic about what we can do to help that. Uh, Keyword, very pessimistic about the near future. What does the near future mean? Does that mean the next six months, 12 months, two years, three years? What are we talking here? So I, I agree with people around here, but you got to understand both in the, especially in the tech industry and to some extent here, but you have people that were just certain they were going to win. Everything was going to break their way. Sure, no one would go out with them in high school, but they're going to own the high school and, and they're going to own the whole state and everything's going to work out and, you know, they have gazillion dollars and all of a sudden all these assumptions aren't actually true. And, you know, they're in a little bit of a depression funk. Uh, and that's that's normal when things do, are not breaking your way, when the world has changed in a way. But, you know, there's... If you didn't already know, Alex Karp does not like uh, Silicon Valley and, and any of those companies over there. That's why I moved Palantir out of there a long, long time ago. A lot of ways to actually make the world a better place. First of all, the West can show we actually have superior technology. And we're showing that. When you said you're pessimistic short term, what do you mean by that? Thank you. Well, I mean, I think that we are just learning as world organizations how to live in a world that is very different than we thought. So I don't think the war is likely to end in, in, in Ukraine. I don't. You don't? I, I think, look, it's very hard to know what's going to happen, but you have an adversary who is zero sum. If Putin goes home and says, hey, we lost, he will lose his life. His friends will lose their life. They'll lose all their money. Uh, and, and, it, and he'll go to his grave feeling that he lost, which he does not want to do. We in the West, most of us in the West, correctly believe if we allow these kind of things to happen, if we allow people to violate the sovereignty of a land and rape, pillage, and destroy people who are innocent in that land, that this will set a horrible precedent. So we can't allow that to happen. Also, we've shown that we develop superior technology and we, combined with heroes on the ground, we can actually win. Uh, and so 
this is just a, still a class of culture. That's a pessimistic view geopolitically of potential war and the like. What's your view of the economy and the ramifications? And maybe it's a ramification of war. No, I think I think Ooh, I like this because we know Alex Karp. He can get so into the weeds of of you know what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, in terms of these geopolitical conflicts and this and that. And uh, I like how he's bringing them over to the economy because that gets more into what's going on with Palantir's business model, what's going on with Palantir's stock price, and many of those various factors. That certainly us as Palantir shareholders is certainly something we obviously care about in a pretty significant way. The chief thing hurting the economy is we're in an unknown zone where things are happening we didn't plan, like wars, trying to deal with the wars, inflation. What do, we're also highly divided inside of our, our countries in the West. What do you make of, you have a lot of corporate clients here. It's not, it's not just uh, government. The feeling from them, their ability to buy, spend more or not right now. Well, they're going to, just like in a war situation, of course, our clients are not in a war situation where they're, it's like not like the Ukraine. But de facto, it's the same thing. We have to survive under much harsher conditions. And what are they going to do? They're going to figure out what works, what doesn't, what's a PowerPoint, what's a fraud, what's actually transforming the business. American businesses here, by and large, have a huge advantage, which America underestimates. What makes Americans interesting? We are very, very pragmatic. We adapt, we learn, we change. You said, what's a PowerPoint and what's a fraud? And the reason I, I raise it is a lot of people who are running around either trying to pretend they're businesses like yours or pretend they're all sorts of businesses. What do you think of the washout that's happened in Silicon Valley, across the world? In like, terms it's of very, very, very hard uh, to be joyous because people are in pain. It, but, I mean, we compete against PowerPoints and basic and technology that is useful but not transformative. What this situ what a situation like the current one we're in, whether it's war in Ukraine, like why did they adopt Palantir? Because you can't afford a PowerPoint or a PowerPoint oh. when your life is on the line. What's gonna ha what's happening to businesses? It wasn't me bleeping it, but thank you CNBC for bleeping it for me. Okay, keep me keep me monetized here. Okay, keep the lights on, the fireplace going. Oh baby, their revenues are going down. There's highly the regulation is going up. Their workforce is unhappy for lots of reasons. They have to somehow rebuild their culture and attack. And that exposes things in your business that are both good, bad, ugly, and transformative. Right. Um, it is a weird time. Though. I mean, I thought something he just brought out there, workforce is unhappy. And, you know, you think about many of those Silicon Valley companies. It's very interesting because those are some of the highest paid workers as a bunch you'll ever find, right? I mean, at many of those companies, the average salary can be two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, right? We're talking about significant amounts of money. And yet some of those workforces are some of the most unhappy and like, I don't want to go back to the office and just kind of like in that, that realm. And I just think like, it's an interesting kind of entitlement. You can say maybe those workers earned it because they went to college or did this or did that, right? But I mean, a lot of other folks, my gosh, if you gave them an opportunity to make two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars a year and work in those beautiful offices, I mean, we're not talking about these are some, you know, dump office buildings that people got to work at. We're talking about these are some of the most amazing offices you'll ever find, right? You know, whether it be Apple's campus, Google's campus, Meta's campus, like you just run through those companies. Look at Amazon's new headquarters. Incredible. And yet people are like, I don't I don't want to actually uh, work there. It's just. It, it's interesting, right? How those workforces act and how they behave. And of course, everybody wants to be like, there's the Palantir of my cockroach.com farm. Like, and it's like, we are the best Palantir for making sure that cockroaches and others get proper nutrition. And yeah, that works under bad conditions, but it does not under good conditions, does not work under bad conditions. What do you make though of the valuations that have, have taken place in Techland, including to your own company? Look, we've been at this for almost 20 years. Our valuation has been very high and very low. What we're very interested in is how is the business doing? I run this business for better or worse. I know how the business is doing. And by the way, over the medium term, not the short term, valuations do affect our, reflect the health, integrity, and success of a business. And in the short term, that fluctuation of valuations expose people are out on the beach naked. You know, if you're out swimming naked, which by the way, I embrace, it's kind of hard when the, you know, it's just like if you're out here without the proper coat, it will, it exposes the weakness in certain businesses. In the end, especially in America, we're adaptive. Those stronger businesses will grow, thrive, expand, and we'll end up with a much healthier. What help. do you tell investors? I, I am curious, like how Palantir's workforce is uh, handling the stock price being obviously pretty devastating, six, seven dollar stock, right? 
And the reason being is so many of their employee force get stock-based compensation. And so I do wonder, but that's not just a Palantir issue. It's, it's across even like many of the Silicon Valley companies that have seen their valuations fall 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, right? So I, I do think about that a little bit. Hey, look, this stock has fallen. Uh, I mean, oh, I, tell, I can tell you, well, investors, I tell our employees, look, there's a market conditions that affects the share price. But is it market conditions? Is it the way the market views your particular company? That, um, that there are investors who are frustrated with what they call dilution, yeah, right? Great. There, there, are lo- there are legitimate and, uh, concerns we have to address. Dil- dilution, what are the revenues going to be, where are the revenues going to develop, how transformative are the products, all legitimate concerns. What the investors we have primarily are most important. This is a breakthrough. The, holy smoke, this ain't no joke. This is a breakthrough, folks. This... Alex Karp really just said that? He just acknowledged all the things that Palantir's got to do a better job of explaining to investors and to Wall Street, right? Because not everybody's going to go down the Palantir rabbit hole and spend, you know, six months of their life trying to research this company and understand it, right? That's a breakthrough. What we just witnessed right there, that's a breakthrough for Alex Karp. Is it the way the market views your particular company? That, um, that there are investors who are frustrated with what they call dilution, yeah, right? Great. There, there, are lo- there are legitimate and, uh, concerns we have to address. Dil- dilution, what are the revenues going to be, where are the revenues going to develop, how transformative are the products, all legitimate concerns. What the investors we have primarily, our most important investors, are co-workers. What we believe is our business is stronger than it's ever been. Right. And we have a lot of evidence that convinces us. We believe our conviction will will convince the world over a multi-year period, and that's what I care about. Right. And and that, but the uh, the question is, were the valuations before when this stock was a forty dollars stock? Yeah, look, did you I, say to yourself that was uh, Alice in uh, Wonderland, let, let me, crazy town? Let, let, let me tell you something. One of the things that's been most helpful about writing this company is that when you're kind of like outside the norm, a little bit of a freak show. Like, I never thought we were that good when the share price was 40, whatever. I didn't think we we're that bad when the share price is six or whatever it is. I know that I know what makes the business strong and I'm focused on that. And I honestly never thought I was that perfect at 40. I don't think I'm. Sounds like he thinks the stock price should be maybe $20 right now. Maybe it's something like that. And now I think it's just like you work on the business, you work on the, you have a huge problem if you're like full on like normal Silicon Valley capitalists pretending you care about altruism or whatever that you actually judge your life by the share price. Let me just ask you one other investor-related question, which is who should the investor base compare your company to? So some people say, oh, it's a consulting company. We should look at Accenture. It should be a multiple of that or not. Other people say, oh, it's a software company. It should be somewhere, it should be in the middle maybe. But what is it? If you doubt what our company is, talk to the Ukrainians, talk to the CEO of Hertz, talk to BP, talk to the special forces. They'll tell you this product saved my life or made my company better. And, you know, if you don't have to believe me, believe them. Um, there was a fascinating uh, piece in the Washington Post. So, I, I, you know, he didn't really answer that question too well, in my opinion. You know, they were really trying to find out what's the most direct comp. And, and that's another issue. If you want to know another issue with Palantir stock is what is the direct comp for Palantir? That's something a lot of people have an issue with, and they don't know. And, and the reason this is important is how do you value the company? And a lot of people, times people like to look at peers and say, well, this company gets valued at such, you know, this, this P ratio, forward P ratio, or price to sales ratio. And so this company deserves to be around there, or they're faster growth, so they deserve a little higher valuation, things like that, right? When you have when you are constantly saying we, we basically have no comp, those sorts of things, people get very confused on like, how do we even value this company against something else? And it creates a problem for value. That really described what uh, Palantir has done and its involvement uh, in Ukraine in a very detailed way. I mean, you, you've alluded to it in some of the interviews that we've done over the years. How, how is that changing the business? And, and now that that's public, if you will, is it changed the kind of conversation you can have? Look, well, we built PG, which single-handedly stopped uh, uh, the rise of the far right in, 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 in Europe. We built Foundry, which uh, was just was used to distribute the COVID vaccine and saved millions of lives globally. We built what we call multi multi constellation, and what's often called the digital kill chain. Um, and they're category defining products. So when you deliver these products to the market, just honestly, people say this isn't going to exist. This isn't right. valuable. But then it changes the market, and then the market is the Palantir market. 
Now, that doesn't mean everyone in the world is going to buy our product, but it means most of the sensible people in the world are going to define, buy from the category we defined. And that is exactly what's happening in the war fighting context. And it's happening because of, I mean, you have to look at this. You have a small country that galvanizes its country, brings its heroes in for, and they're up against the third most important army in the world. And they win. They, every single country in the world that finds out, that asks, well, how did you do it? What can we do? What is the cost of that? How long does the implementation take? I always ask you this, but given the increasing tensions, it appears, between the U.S. and China, where are we? And what are our capabilities? And what do you worry about? The, the, we are very lucky the Chinese, Chinese uh, government is very focused on internal security. U.S. has to heavily, heavily, and its allies, focus on external security. We are better at software than the Chinese, but we're also better at focusing on something we care about. How do you repel a, an adversary that wants to invade your territory? It should be the single focus of the, and we are, partly because we're better at it and partly because that's the need. If we had a conversation here in 10 years' time, would China have taken Taiwan, tried to take Taiwan? What do you think happens? I think it largely depends on how powerful our software, hardware, hero quotient is. If we continue to do what we're doing in the Ukraine, look, if Russia had known what Russia knows now, I think there's a pretty strong chance they would not have invaded. SPACs. What was the... I agree with that. I agree with what you just said. I agree. Lesson of investing in SPACs. Most companies were not prepared for bad weather like we were. Stay away from companies that are not prepared for bad weather. That was the lesson, but you invested in, in companies that were, no. were not prepared for bad weather. Exactly. We should be more investing in ourselves, not investing in companies that are not prepared for bad How weather. How did that happen? Look, we are the world's best, in my view, at building software before people need the software. You make mistakes along the way. We made a mistake. We corrected it. We're moved on. Hey, I like that. So actually a fairly solid interview from Alex Karp there. Um, I appreciate that. I didn't think it was necessarily a great interview. Uh, I don't think it's, I mean, of the Alex Karp interviews, that one got more accomplished than most, I'll say that. I think he still has another level to go in, in relation to, you know, explaining where this company's really going over the long term in terms of growth rates and those sorts of things and what he's expecting from the company. So uh, solid interview. I think he's still got another level to go as a, the CEO of a public company. And I would love to see maybe in the future, another key executive with him alongside, you know, for an interview like that, who understands maybe the CFO, who can understand, you know, some of those questions, maybe, you know, direct some of those business related questions a little more toward, toward maybe the CFO, right? Or, or maybe the chief operating officer, somebody like that, right? And you could be in a situation where maybe some of the more business questions are maybe answered a little more directly and, and maybe a little more about Wall Street fashion. And Alex Karp can really dive in on some of those more geopolitical type questions there that obviously are his strength. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this as always. I appreciate everybody joining me. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being subscribed to the channel. And also thank you everybody that supports the channel on Patreon. If you would like to support the channel on Patreon, check out the pinned comment down there. You also get access to all my buys and sells in the Patreon portfolio. Much love and have a great day.